Okay, so our, our coming up now is our security panel. And uh, people are going to start turning their cameras on. So we'll get all of that. We'll let everybody queue up. And, and I don't want to do everybody's intros. I'm going to let uh, Kevin do those intros. But we've got Kevin Green, who works here at Parasoft. And we've got Matt Labrie and uh, John Chase. And we have an actual picture of his real face here. So uh, people may not realize what a, a groundbreaking moment this is to see real human John Chase live. <laughs> so so um, with that, uh, Kevin, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. This is my actually my first automated security test and quality summit, so I'm I'm very excited to be a part of this. And coming along with me, I have two esteemed panelists, and I'm going to give them the the proper respect and allow them to introduce themselves before we get started with our session. Matt, can you go first? Yeah, I'm a software engineer uh, architect with uh, Capital Services. I've been in the uh, technology department world for about 25 years to age myself. Um, capital services, what we do is we originate and service credit cards for a portfolio of uh, banks. Um, so uh, PCI DSS compliance is very important to us and our company is very, uh, very security oriented. So um, one of the things I've been doing recently is working with our software development team on improving our software development uh, life cycle and some of that's included um, adding security to our life cycle uh, shifting some stuff to the left and, and that sort of thing so about it. Shifting to the left I like it John thanks for having me guys uh, so my name is John Chase I work for AT&T Cybersecurity Consulting uh, we're a full service uh, security consulting organization. I've been in tech for about 20 years, um, doing full-time security for nine. Uh, I kind of got pulled into InfoSec by attending the DEF CON security conference in Las Vegas, and I loved it so much that I decided to do it for a, a full-time career. Um, I say my job is to be the best bad guy for my clients that I can be. Um, I conduct tests uh, ranging from network penetration tests to social engineering uh, into the application security um, world as well. Thank you both. I think you both bring, you know, unique perspectives. You know, I want to, you know, just set the tone real quick and kind of talk about uh, the session. So, you know, obviously with digital transformation, organizations are embracing it um, very fast, right? A lot of organizations are embracing the whole digital transformation and is helping them deliver uh, to their employees, deliver to their customers, as well as to their partner uh, capabilities and service at business speed. So this brings some unique challenges but security becomes a core part of helping organizations deliver continuous value. Things that come to mind is, cl is cloud. cloud. Cloud is one of the most widely adopted digital transformation efforts. DevOps, culture, and building that culture to help deliver on these capabilities and services. CICD pipeline becomes the heartbeat in terms of how automation uh, is helping people deploy and deliver software to meet the business needs. Um, one of the things I want to point out, Garner did a research and their research was in the speed up your digital business transformation. And it indicated that 87% of senior business leaders feel digitization is a company priority. And, aston and astonishing 79% of corporate strategists say it is reinventing their business and creating new revenue streams. So now I see why everyone is doing this digital transformation. So I want to open up and talk about uh, the role security, your security initiatives are playing in helping your companies deliver on their digital transformation. So what are some key initiatives to help you drive and help your organization realize return on investment regarding your digital transformation in your organization? John, you can go first with that. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not necessarily, you know, I don't have any initiatives within my organization relative to this. However, I see the aftermath of these initiatives, either positive or negative, um, you know, be it, um, you know, good security and bad security. Uh, if, if you have all the right things within your, um, uh, you know, policies and frameworks together, then um, I'm going to see that in the end. And so some of the things I'm seeing is, uh, you know, 
you know, we're not we're not typically looking at the you know the frameworks that are out there. Those are uh, not available. A lot of the developers are being tasked with being security professionals, and that is a difficult thing to ask them to do because it is a specific discipline. Um, you know, we are getting some automated tools out there to help them. You know, such as the Parasoft suite of tools and the, the portfolio that you offer. However, you know, at some point you have to have a trained professional lay like eyes on these applications manually. Um, I see those typically like, you know, once a year when the PCI compliance comes up and like, you know, this is the time of year where we're just cranking through these assessments right. because everyone's trying to get them done by the end of the year, which don't do that, by the way. Like you want to get those things done earlier because you need the time to remediate, st um, you know, whatever we find. But, you know, with that said, um, you know, there's a whole lot of, you know, things that are coming up after the fact too, um, you know, that I've talked about. And I would also say that, you know, some of the breaches that we've uh, seen occur uh, are kind of speak to where we're at in the space. Um, supply chain attacks are becoming more prevalent. You know, the solar winds attack, the uh, Kasei attack that happened on the 4th of July weekend. Um, there was also, uh, you know, we, we see a lot of uh, secrets that are getting released and that can lead to, uh, you know, Bitcoin mining being spun up inside of your infrastructure, that kind of thing. So, you know, that's what I'm seeing from the, the kind of the aftermath of bad digital transformation and not focusing on security in the CICD uh, pipeline process. So that's kind of where I'm at on these things. So, so Matt, how, so what, what type of security initiatives? I think, John, you did a good job at, at bringing a perspective that I think is unique to the role you play within digital transformation and helping AT&T with their customers and so forth and so on. But Matt, I think you have, you know, a different perspective and I definitely want to hear from you in terms of your, the different types of security initiatives you guys have to kind of help drive your digital transformation. Sure. Um, yeah, we've, um, I think it's been about a year and a half. We um, started looking at um, some of the, the static application security testing uh, tools out there and, and decided to uh, go with the Parasoft.test product um, for that, along with the DTP reporting server. And so for the, about the last year and a half, um, we've been um, working through running the PCI OWASP and CWE um, rule sets uh, against our code statically so that um, we can uh, get some findings that, that have come up out there and uh, work on those. And um, so, yeah, that's been one of the things we've been working on. Um, more recently, we've um, started um, doing some API testing. Um, we, we've got a fair amount of APIs and we've been doing some testing on them, but we started to look for a tool, um, I don't think it's probably been eight months ago or so, um, to help us test those. And so um, we've actually been working with the Parasoft SOA test uh, um, product and um, putting those together. Um, and then hopefully um, plan is um, maybe in the near term to uh, look at utilizing some security tests um, against those API um, that we've been building and um, moving a little bit more of our pen testing um, that we've been doing externally, internally, and um, that'll lead to you know, shifting some of our testing a little bit more to the left and getting our developers a little more um, involved with that. So, yeah, that's I think you both. I think you both bring up some or allude to some very uh, interesting things I wanna pull a thread on a little bit more. Um, in order to do transformation, I'm starting to believe, well, I, well, I mean, not starting, I, I believe from 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 the start, uh, because obviously this is what I'm passionate about. Uh, you, you have to have an aggressive approach uh, to security, right? And one of the things that comes to mind is software security play a huge role, given that a lot of digital transformation is software, right? Software is so ubiquitous, right? It, it touches every part of our lives. Uh, it powers the world. And so with software, the attack surface increases as businesses start to extend um, um, to the cloud, to different different other platforms. Uh, it increases it increases the attack surface. How should organizations address this as part of their security initiatives, with you know the risks associated with extending the business as part of digital transformation, which has you know it has a ripple effect because it can potentially expose uh, further increase the exposure to an attack surface. So I'll say that, you know, there's varying degrees of maturity from an information security program standpoint in a lot of the organizations that we encounter. 
Um, you know, some of them don't have anything, and we're seeing that the fundamentals in a lot of cases still aren't being addressed. Um, you know, updates aren't being performed to software. We're seeing, um, uh, you know, environments are flat. Uh, training isn't occurring for InfoSec in general. So, you know, I come at this from a holistic approach. It's not just, you know, down into the DevOps, you know, pipeline that we're concerned about. It's the entirety of the organization's security as a whole. You want to start with the policy in your organization and work your way down from there. If you don't have a policy, if you're a um, you know frontline employee and you're trying to affect change in the organization and you don't have that executive sponsorship, it's going to be very difficult for you to to make any sort of headway. So I would start with you know kind of you know making sure that you have your security program off the ground uh, initially, and then you know going through a maturity process because it's not just you know, one thing you're going to be doing, it is a whole series of steps and it takes years. I've seen organizations, you know, over the last decade, you know, that I come into, they're really insecure, like in the retail space, you know, back in the early 2010s, you know, registers were just a really bad place. You saw the the hacks in the different retail space. And I identified a lot of those um, with my clients at the time and I saw them over, it took them a lot of time to, to change all those devices in their environment, um, but eventually they got there and they got secure. So um, you can't think that you're gonna get everything done at once. It's a process, it's not a, it's not necessarily a product. Products are important, but you gotta start with the policies, the procedures, and then the processes from there, starting at the top. Before you go, Matt, let me pull on that a little bit more. John, do you think the, the, reason, the reason why people are slow to change is a policy or are there some other attributing factors where people are so slow to change and and i always say people are slow oh, there's to a, so many i mean it's it's going to vary by organization one i think is a lot of um you know ignorance that they don't know what they need to do a, a lot of it i think is learned helplessness like they're going to get in anyway so like let's why, why bother doing anything right um you know we're kind of in a cyber war right now i mean you can say that that's what's occurring and you know the the securing the code is one part of that, but I mean, there's so many different moving parts to a mature security organization. Um, you know, it, it, uh, this is not something we can cover in, in a small talk like this. I mean, th there's full classes <laughs> devoted to, to securing environments and entire like, you know, master's degrees that you can take in just one part of this discipline. So, um, you know, it's a big problem, I would say, is another issue. It's just, there's so much to do it's it's almost overwhelming for most organizations what, what bothers me is that we're moving fast with digital transformation and two mm -hmm. things two trends that i've been kind of tracking since my days in the federal government when i was funding research is that the time to exploit is shrinking right but the time to patch is also is farther going farther right so there are two 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 things that are not against our side, right? You know, adversaries are are, are compromising systems uh, within you know hours before a vendor even releases a patch or a fix for a a particular vulnerability. But people, for whatever reason, patching has become the Achilles the Achilles heels of software engineering. And people it's been are like that for 20 years. Right. Like, so, I so, keep thinking like one day this is going to be solved and I'm going to be out of a job and it never happens. Right. So so we're, so we're moving at a faster pace because we have because companies and organizations are trying to deliver value faster to customers. But in right. the counterpart of that is is that the, the there may be a larger attack service being exposed, right? Poorly developed software, technical debt, however you want to to summarize it. And it's and it's and it's causing a lot of problems. Matt, what are what do you think are some of ways that that security initiatives should be tailored to address some of these issues that we see that could be risks associated with digital transformation? Well, I, I think I think what uh, what I guess we have to look at is is number one the, the buy-in from the from the executives and the, and the management and at our company. That's something that's really good. Um, We've always been strong on security where I'm at, but I don't I don't know that other companies it's out that, that way. Um, so um, getting that early buy in there, um, establishing your security teams and, and empowering them to um, make change um, it kind of starts there. And then and then a lot of it comes down to collaboration with the development team. 
Um, our security team has um, has been done a really good job of coming to us with different ideas. Um, the, the static um, application security testing that we've done actually kind of started as an initiative out of out of our security team. They, I believe they were um, at a conference or somewhere and kind of you know came back to us and said, "Hey, we got this tool, you know, that we, we ran across and is really good." And, and you know, and our development team looks at it and kind of agrees with them and say, "Hey, that's something that you know would really help us out, not only for our you know development ongoing but but our uh, but our but our just even looking at you know what's what do we have in our legacy code and so yeah there's there's um that and then obviously um, just continuing to monitor different uh, things available in the organization to secure things down um we 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 do security at, at a lot of different levels and layers and so i think i think that helps out a little bit but um but yeah i mean there's there's always there's always risk you know in different areas of the patching you know you brought patching and that's always something that you know takes time and as long as, as, as more tools are available i think that'll that'll improve things and, and you know it's just a combination of working working with uh the tools and um, the, the people to to really um get an organization where it needs to be yeah, I think you guys made some really good points, right? I think, you know, John uh, talking about the need to have the policy, the governance in place to kind of help guide how technology is going to be deployed, how it's going to be managed. Um, Matt, you brought up some really good points as well about having that top cover, right? The support from mm -hmm. top management and push down. But one of the things that we're seeing, and, and it seems like it's becoming a systemic problem around the whole digital transformation, but more particularly within a DevSecOps context, is is the friction that exists in a lot of organizations between AppSec and Dev, and, and figuring out how do we remove those barriers that that are that is is creating additional friction uh, to to either uh, impact productivity, uh, cause delays. So do you guys have any thoughts on that? And, and what are some, some ways organizations can kind of help smooth and, 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 and remove some of those barriers that, that have been so systemic with, with, with what has been traditionally silo environments and now people have to come together or you know different parts of the organization have to come together and collaborate and, and more effectively to, to help you know, achieve business mission, achieve the business mission. Yeah, my thoughts on this is, you know, you're talking about, you know, developers and uh, security professionals and, you know, they have competing interests, to be honest, in a lot of ways. Uh, and I think that we need to we need to kind of merge the two interests together. Right. I mean, if you've ever been in the midst of a breach and you've you've participated in a post breach investigation, you know, it's not a pleasant process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when those things occur, everyone in the organization is going to be involved and they're going to be affected in one way or the other right Absolutely. um you know so typically like we tell people post breach it's like well whatever wish list you had together for things you wanted you know get it ready because you're going to get everything you ever wanted from a security perspective but you know i i think that that uh you know team building and bringing the two together you know that that's i think key and i mean you know, we're asking more again of, of developers than we ever have before. We're asking them to kind of be security professionals in a way, and that's a challenge, right? I mean, that's that takes a lot of training. That takes a lot of effort to get them to uh, understand, you know, what the issues are, um, and how to defend against them. And then, of course, you know, having the tooling that's going to catch, you know, when those mistakes have occurred is really important too. And that happens at different parts of the, the DevOps process, right? Dev, DevSecOps process. I mean, you know, when you have your static analysis you know, occurring at one part of it, your dynamic analysis occurring in another, uh, your library checking to make sure that all the libraries you're pulling into your software are secure. Um, those are all really important. And, you know, a lot of the time, too, when those things come up uh, from the scanners, the findings that come up, you know, the developers might need some assistance interpreting what those risks le levels are for those. I mean, there's context to, to the findings. Like in some cases, you know, a finding may come up that in your environment, you know, it might say it's a high, but, you know, in actuality, because of some mitigating controls, it's a low. And that's where you need to have that um, that really cohesive um, communication and team building between your developers and your security professionals. And it's everybody's responsibility. That kind of needs to be, I think, ingrained 
in um, the culture within the organization, and it's often not. I mean, I remember one point I was trying to, you know, evangelize to a, develop, a developer, a manager of developers. I'm like, look, this is what the things you need to be doing. You need to be securing your code. Here's the kind of uh, training you need to be looking at. And I mean, he straight up told me that, like, no, that's not my responsibility. That's the security team's responsibility. They need to tell me what I need to do. They need to, you know, tell me what vulnerabilities I need to fix. And I just don't think that that is a tenable um, position to, to be in from a, a software security perspective. It's everyone's responsibility. You know, I, I I think that you brought you bring up some interesting points, and I think the goal really should be uh, to build security in from the onset, and being able to have technologies capabilities that developer have confidence in using early, doing it early, right? That it can embed into their to their developer workflows, right? Where it's seamless, where it's it's context it's context rich. And what I mean by that is, is it helped guide them in making the right decision around how they code, how they develop software. And I think, you know, having funding research in static analysis in the government for, for about six or six years, one of the things I try to do is figure out how do we modernize around static analysis to remove some of the negative sentiments that have been associated with, with static analysis, like false positives, right? And, <laughs> and, 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 and the burden that false positives have on developers, right? And, right. And, and the negative sentiment in, in affecting early adoption by developers using these tools. We want developers to use the tools early, right, in their workflows. Um, one of the reasons why I came to Parasoft is the whole quality, continuous testing quality uh, uh, message where quality and security live so close together, right? So you're building it in together, it's, it's intrinsically together. And I do think that is one of the things that I'm starting to see organizations or companies do. They're, they're starting to improve how they deliver right static analysis early right doing it early to developers matt have you seen that same experience in terms of being able to you know use static analysis as early as possible within development workflow because obviously shift left to people means shift left into continuous integration but i'm thinking you need to push further left into a developer workflow Right. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, the our, our status, our static analysis has, has been moved all the way to our development tool. So um, nice. you know, we're running, we're running the static analysis, the same static analysis that, you know, we have sitting in a gateway out there um, before it even enters into our, our test environments. So our developers are, are, are kind of forced to um, do static analysis on their own up front and, and they want to, they don't want to have to go back and, and retouch code later on, you know, as a developer, you, you prefer not to have issues, right? You, you end up having them, but you prefer not to. So obviously putting tools up front um, is kind of what we want to see too. So um, yeah, and then obviously um, the collaboration with the security team when we review suppressions and, and things like that um, is a little bit of a training opportunity for, for both us and them. Um, right. You know, um, it's just not that uh, security knows all the answers necessarily either for what could happen in code. Um, developers also, you know, kind of help with some of that too. But um, but definitely, um, the tool has really helped us from a standpoint of just um, learning and understanding um, better what areas of code we need to, you know, be more careful with as well. Um, it's, it's nice seeing in our code reviews guys stepping up and mentioning, hey, you know what, that's probably not going to pass our code analysis. You know, um, you're probably going to want to rerun code analysis on that if you have it. You know, um, and that and that that's just one of those things where um, it's an added benefit of bringing in a tool like that is the actual ability to um, learn from it and and learn about some of those um, things that maybe you wouldn't have if you didn't yeah. have that. Yeah, I always say secure coding is our first line of defense. It's one of our first line of right. defense in in in, in improving not only the quality and security around software, but just help preventing, right? It's a preventive measure that we can do to help prevent cyber attacks. I wanna right. shift a little bit and I wanna talk about um, what do you perceive as some of the benefits you have realized by making security an enabler for your digital transformation? Well, um, um, for us, obviously, the just our overall software security posture. Um, you know the the management team and, and stuff is, is really happy with the steps we've taken to um, go through our, our code even you know our legacy code and, and looking at things and, and cleaning up things and, and um, it also um, is a matter of uh, 
a matter of the uh, of the of kind of the, the the peace of mind knowing that when um, new OWASP or new PCI or, or new CWE kind of rules come out, um, that with the tool that we have, we have that ability to to run those tests right away and um, and find anything that maybe has been missed or whatever. But um, but those are our two areas um, that have benefited us. Um, obviously, you know, the, just getting the the peace of mind knowing that you've went through the code and that there's nothing out there that sticks out and um, you know makes you um, appreciate appreciate that that's something that you've done. Um, so, um, John, I'm, I'm, like I mentioned, the training obviously, obviously the things that we've learned from the tool, like I mentioned just a little bit ago, is, is one of the biggest benefits that we've seen from it as well. Just um, better at coding and understanding those things. John, I'm going to ask you a slightly different question. Mm -hmm. because, of, because of the role you play mm -hmm. the security tester, obviously static analysis finds one set of issues associated with software. There's other software testing techniques and capabilities mm -hmm. that are part of the application security testing portfolio and helping right. identify and uh, identify vulnerabilities in software. Um, what do you think are some good strategies in, for building a robust testing capability around supporting what we say is digital transformation because because things are changing right we're not in the data center like we used to be there's cloud there's kubernetes there's microservices what do you think are some good security testing strategies the company should be aware of? from a testing perspective um i mean i know that we're focusing on some of the automated dynamic testing but mm -hmm. i'm a big proponent of manual testing by a security professional um, at some point in the process right because you know I still find vulnerabilities that all your tools are not going to find, right? Um, I'll give you some examples. Um, you know, I, I've encountered uh, web applications that um, are presenting APIs to, you know, the world, you know, from a, I mean, somewhat of an authenticated perspective, but, you know, you start to analyze those calls and you see things like, hey, customer ID, I have a customer ID right here. And I'm logged in as maybe customer 1157, right? And that's my customer ID. I say, you know, give me the information for customer ID 1157. Well, I can take that request and then just like, you know, run a script to give me every single customer and dump out everything that way. I don't have to do an SQL injection. I just interface with your API with the way that you presented it. And I can get like, you know, your customer's addresses, phone numbers, everything, right? Through what you've given me, through the, the um, applications, um, features, right? So, I mean, those are some of the things that you really have to have a manual test done. I would say, you know, depending on what your appetite for risk is, um, you know, some of it's driven by compliance that you want to do like at least once a year, you know, some other organizations want to see that done um, when you're making a major code change. Other organizations are going to be doing it on a quarterly basis or something like that. Um, and if you don't have the capabilities in-house, I'd suggest you reach out, find a um, an application security tester that's um, that's good that you um, can work with and have them do the check the check for you um, those kind of checks. Now, I mean, we're talking about these other environments too, like you know, the microservices, Kubernetes, Docker, um, you know, the various AWS, you know, DigitalOcean, wherever it might be that you're living in these environments. Uh, you got to also consider that that underlying infrastructure might not be secure. Like it might be delivered to you with underlying CVEs that you need to deal with. So I would say, you know, be checking the infrastructure too, right? Because what you're spinning up could be inherently vulnerable. Um, you can't trust that the cloud provider is going to do everything correctly. Um, so, you know, just keep an eye on that too. Now, you know, I know that we've talked a lot about, about prevention, right? Um, but the, the prevention, you know, that we're talking about in the um, software development process, making sure we're securing the code is just one piece of those lines of defense you've mentioned, right? Uh, we always like to talk about defense in depth within the security field. So you want to have multiple lines of defense, right? One of those lines of defense is going to be obviously the, the prevention, but it's also detection. You want to make sure that if, if you are under attack, you're seeing that attack occurring. And I think that's a big blind spot for a lot of organizations is they don't know if they're under attack. Um, I think that when you're developing your applications, you should be building in some checks for that so that if an attack is underway, you're getting alerted. Like maybe it's a password spray that's occurring against a login portal. Maybe it is a, a you know an application security scan, like where they're looking for vulnerabilities in your software. 
I, I don't see a lot of organizations even uh, detecting that. Like, you know, they don't have a good SIM, they don't have good visibility in their environment, you know, that kind of thing. And if a breach does occur, are you prepared to respond to it? So that's that's another you know part of the defense and depth methodology is you have your prevention, you've got your detection, and then your response. How are you going to respond? Okay, they've gotten into a server. How far did they get? How are you going to you know in, in, uh, start your digital forensics investigation on that? Who's going to be involved? Your incident response plan needs to be engaged. So I mean, it's just one part of a larger um, holistic strategy, like I've been mentioning. And yeah, that's what the developers need to think about too. That that dwell time is so important, right? Um, the dwell time, meaning the time you know, adversary uh, is able to you know launch Years. Attack and be and be right, yeah. right. It becomes important. But you 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 pulled off something that was very interesting. And Arthur and I were talking about this. We did a we just recorded a podcast episode with someone from Mitre talking about some of the the, the new enhancements to to uh, CWE. And one of the things that we we asked was. Uh, we noticed that SQL injection is not number one anymore. Like, not, no, so, I don't see it much anymore. But but you brought up something about about APIs, right? And how APIs can can and expose uh, uh, um, certain certain information, right? Um, that that probably in in, in reality, in, to a certain extent, can make SQL injection a less likely attack vector if I can go directly after your APIs to get the same type of information. Right. I yeah, I would just run a script. Just run a right. script and take it all. So, so we I mean, were, you should be looking for that. Heads. Right, we were scratching our heads and saying, well, wow, you know, it's in, you know, what, we're first going to look for Swagger, John, that's available, and then run your script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, expose Swagger, Wizdles. I mean, you know, that information disclosure is one of the first things you go for. Um, I mean, we do see that occasionally. There, there's actually scanners that will look for that, like to try to brute force like the location of the Wizdle and stuff. Right. But right. you know, I think that to your point though, Kevin, is like when you start to see that someone's like sucking down all your customer data are you going to see that like like maybe it's just running metrics like hey we're seeing like a thousand more requests per per hour than we normally see something like that and that is enough for you to start to investigate to find out what's going on so while, while all the de no, 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 you talked about detection now while all the detection is has been focused on sql injection right now 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 the attack vector is moving to api you know api right. The APIs are, have the potential to reveal even more information. Um, I, I was talking to, uh, I don't know if you've been searching, been looking at the, the attack around John Deere. The APIs were exposed and it was a, you know, a security researcher called Sick Codes. And he and I were talking on Twitter and we were talking about, you know, some of the, some of the poor design, some of the, some of the ongoing issues that have been associated with authentication authorization around poorly defined uh, APIs. Hey guys, we got a couple of minutes left. Uh, before we go, I want to get some key lessons learned uh, that you can share re with respect to your digital transformation journey. What are some key lessons learned that you can, lessons learned that you can share regarding your journey? Sure. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that um, that we learned was um, upfront, which which helped us out, um, was kind of evaluating obviously some of our some of our findings that we were seeing um, and then realizing that a lot of those that we could um, enhance some of our validation libraries and our logging libraries and, and different uh, frameworks that we've got in place that, that would allow us to utilize those across our several applications, both externally and internally, um, and, and to make sure that um, those were tightened up and, and we're covering things so we're getting a better code quality as we were making some changes and adjustments. Um, the other thing was, um, um, like we talked about earlier, uh, establishing uh, a suppression review process. Um, early on, uh, like John mentioned, the findings a lot of times are, are contextual based. And so, you know, you might have uh, several findings for the same thing, but um, it's not even necessarily maybe an issue because of the context. And right. so our developers would sit there and look for ways to, you know, fix that when really it wasn't really anything to be fixed. It, it was actually just... Let's, let's suppress that. So a lot of times developers initially when you start using a tool, are kind of like, well, do I really want to suppress that or not? And, and so you kind of want to have a process in place so that they understand what is something you can suppress and, and what is something that we're probably going to turn back and, and have you look at again. And so so that's a process we've been um, I'm doing and, and something I would suggest people to set up and, and include their security team and, and developers in it and rotate your developers in and out of it so that um, it's a learning process, you know, like anything else. 
And then um, the other thing is is uh, the DTP server that we utilize for Parasoft. Um, as we've been working through some of our items um, across applications and legacy code, obviously we get a lot of findings when you're looking at code that's been out there for 20 years. Um, and so um, that the DTP servers really helped us as far as allowing us to um, see those numbers go down as we work on different things. And so, um, so that's something that that I would you know advise people to look at is, is find a way to you know whether it's KPI or the reporting server. Um, Give developers and your staff the ability to see as you're as you're lowering those numbers down that they're making a difference um, and hopefully securing code at the same time. So. Hey, keep your eyes open with DTP. I think that that has we have a lot of potential there, and, and I'm excited about uh, the 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 opportunity to do some really really cool things around that to give you know uh, customers more visibility into risk associated with software. What about you, John? Uh well, you know, I kind of just want to close with more of, um, you know, the security community itself is really open, right? You kind of know this, Kevin, that there's a lot of really good content out there. There's a lot of really good contributors in the security community, and they're willing to, like, talk to you um, and, and help you and at least get you started, right? Um, so, you know, if you don't know where to start with information security, I mean, there's a lot of you know great people in the community that are willing to kind of you know get involved and and you know, you know help you. And there's also a lot of um, I would say like you know like YouTube and even on Discord, I, I see a lot of community building going on. So you know get involved in those places too. Um, you know even there's local hacking groups you can you can get in touch with like the local DEF CON groups. Uh, go to a local DEF CON group, go to a meetup, like, you know, a lot of them like meet once a month. Um, you can find that on the DEF CON um, website uh, to find out what your local, like, you know, DEF CON group is. And there's going to be a collective of hackers in your area that will be more than happy to talk your ear off about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, just those are kind of places I would advise people to start, you know, seeking out is, you know, security resources and those experts. Um, like I said, I mean, we're really open. We want to talk to you um, and just, don't be afraid. Um, now, as far as the digital transformation is occurring, I'm seeing it just accelerating in, in general. Um, either startups are just coming out of the gate with infrastructure as code and no like on-site prem at all. Like, you know, offices are closing. I mean, especially in post-COVID world, right? That's just not, you know, corporate real estate is kind of in the tank right now. Everyone's working from home. The attack surface has kind of shifted in that regard as well. Like, you know, oh, yeah. we've, got, we've got VPNs, we've got, you know, you know your your um, your cloud infrastructure, the, the, the offices are closing, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, hybrid environments are still, you know, a good, a good place to go to, especially for cost savings for some of the things you don't need in the cloud. But I don't see it getting smaller. I see it getting bigger. No, I agree. I, I think, um, you know, the, the attack service is going to continue to grow. And I think, you know, uh, you know, you know, we we here at Parasol, I think we are well positioned to kind of help customers address some of those concerns, some of those challenges around uh, software security. Hey, guys, it's been it's been great. Uh,